Okay, so thank you, thank you first of all to to the organizer for for the nice invitation. Thank you, Tom, and uh, to this great event, uh, and for you to sticking around till uh, Friday afternoon. So um, my talk will be slightly different from the one you have seen so far, uh, because it's meant to give you not the result of our research, but more the feeling of a scientist that works for a research organization like the Joint Research Center, which is there to provide fundamentally scientific support uh, to, the, to the process of policy making of the commission. Um, my thoughts about uh, where, where are we going and why open science is so relevant uh, in a time that I define of crisis. Uh, it, it's a time of crisis because as you see in this cartoon that was drawn by my colleague Giacomo Grassi, we are fundamentally in the situation of having humanity on a boat, uh, which is on a, on a collision route against uh, a nice sheet where um, we expect actually to have major damages. And, and in a situation where we either change our route, uh, and this proves to be rather difficult through mitigation efforts, um, you have to turn south if you want to reach a safe route towards 1.5, which seems to be almost more and more difficult, if not impossible. Or we change the boat by making it stronger through adaptation option, uh, transform it eventually in an icebreaker if we can. So because of this, it's an underlying, uh, if you want, crisis that is around us and is really um, in my heart. And, and I think it's in your too, as, as environmental scientist. We are living in, in a situation where crises are coming, one of the other. Now we had COVID with pandemic, now recession, limitation of resources, maybe climate change, as I was saying, biodiversity collapse. So for, for someone working in, in, a, in a scientific organization that uh, where you know, scientific papers is just one of the goals, the rest is try to produce knowledge, which is good for, uh, for producing good policy. Um, this, this frame... <laughs> is quite worrying and, and, and it's, you know, start thinking what, what can we and why, uh, what can we do with science? Because at the end, science, if you think, was uh, what provided the knowledge to generate this crisis. Uh, we started to extract uh, fossil fuel and to, to feed our industrialization process and have free, uh, access to, let's say, low cost energy. And, and science now we are thinking is the only way to make knowledge-based transformation of the society towards uh, a more sustainable, sustainable future. Uh, and the project like this is about that, you now building the capacity for science to, to fix the damage that former science has, has generated. In a, in a situation like this, um, what science is doing at the moment is certainly try to produce knowledge and distill knowledge like in, in this spatial report, uh, in this um, um, summary report for policymaker of the IPCC, that feeds into this large, large project, or the large process, I would say, of the United Nations, like the COP, no, to deal with uh, this massive global problem that we have at the moment. Um, this is fine, is working. I think, you no, know, the, the COP are advancing. On one side, they say, yeah, we, we, we are doing progress, but so far, actually, the progress didn't really bring to mitigation efforts that are sufficient. And, and in particular, the, the challenge we have at the moment is to deal not only with climate change or to build science in the direction of environmental sustainability, but to do it in a more complex three-dimensional space where we manage to have environmental sustainability together with social sustainability and economic sustainability. Um, because if we don't manage to achieve also the other two, uh, it will be difficult to achieve the environmental side of it. And that's, in a way, the frontier that we are um, facing at the moment, how to make our environmental policies uh, acceptable and sustainable for the social uh, side and also economic, uh, economically sustainable. Um, fundamentally, what we are facing here is, is, a, is, a, is a triangle where, where science is just one of the components in, in a scheme where we have uh, to interact with, with the process of policymaking, which fundamentally produce new rules, new, new strategies, uh, pushing in certain direction or the other with incentives or taxes, if it is incentives. 
and, and the public. No? And, and this process uh, within this triangle, uh, open science, I mean, having a process that leads to um, replicable uh, science, uh, robust, objective, trustable formation of knowledge is really fundamental because around these three domains of science, politics, and public, you see many words which are a bit worrying. Now we have uh, on the science, we have a certainty, we have to produce scenarios, we have to test causality. We have been discussing during this day, here many talks about that, you know, how we have to be transparent. And that's in a way the recipe we are building to try to increase the scientific content of the policy to make policy really more sounding. Um, and GLC is actually, that's the mission, if you want, we have to try to bring content, scientific content to politics. Of course, you also have potentially a feedback, uh, which may lead to politicization of science, because as a policy as has its own uh, issue around now, what, 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 what policy system you're know, speaking now, how, how do we deal with this problem in a democracy versus a technocracy? Uh, how do we deal with the time horizon of the actions versus the, the, time, uh, the time horizon of, of the policy itself, which is maybe very short? And the public, of course, with all the situation they have, uh, of course, the public at the end control the politics by through election, uh, at least in democratic country. Um, so you, you have to have their, their, their agreement, their support. Um, th these three elements of the puzzle have to go together. And, and, and when you do your, your science, in a, you think about it, in, by, by acting uh, on the three elements, not just on the one, it's not just about writing a paper, but to make it policy relevant and to build it in a way that uh, also the public can trust it because it's, uh, it's open, it can be replicated, it's fair. Um, it's, um, it's not leading to polarization, it's not um, potentially uh, not disrupting uh, or bringing to uh, fake news in, in the media. Um, speaking about a bit more about environmental science, what we are doing with this science in the environmental domain, uh, what we have, what we are seeing at the moment is that the priority of our work are, are changing in time. Now we went from pollution to mitigation and starting in mid 90s Kyoto Protocol and, and but so far if you look at the CO2 concentration keep rising so mitigation was not so incredibly successful uh, now we started to speak about adaptation 15 years ago 20 years ago and now maybe is really management of of environmental climate driven crisis like what we have maybe for central part of Europe for many many forested area um, so in this evolving uh, pattern land as a whole is emerging as, as a critical element and for a series of reasons. So it's fundamentally land is where the people lives, where we produce food, you know, where we, where the impacts, when the warming is higher, when the impacts is higher, when we have also water uh, amplifying further the, the, uh, the impact of the warming you now with combined droughts, heat wave events. Fundamentally is the area where we have ha very high social and economic sensitivity for the environmental crisis, and I would say also for the environmental policies. So land is where this triangle between science, policy, and, and, and society, it's, it's more relevant and, and stronger. Uh, and, um, and that's because we have, we know, um, I think all you know, all this graph, I mean, the, the disruption of ecosystem services, the, the shortages of resources leading to, uh, for instance, to food security issues, um, in particular in, in developing countries, uh, but in general, also the, the fact that some of the key ecosystem services like the CO2 uptake of, of the terrestrial biomes can, can actually be already in a quite a decline state. Uh, these are all our, our major, really major elements that will affect our, our policy, our life, uh, our society in the future. So in a scenario uh, like this, you know, how, do we, how do we deal with the preservation of all these ecosystem services? And this comes, the politics if you want, and I'll show you an incredible graph, I don't pretend you to read, but in the center, you have fundamentally what is in discussion at the moment, for instance, in Europe, forest monitoring at European scale. Um, we have been discussing a lot today, here a lot of talks today about monitoring deforestation. Gilberto gave a fantastic talk this morning. Um, 
And the, the, the four dimension that is touching the, the bio the bioeconomy, the, the environment, the climate, and generally the information system, the statistics, and around the circle, those are individual policies or strategies, either already just approved or in the making of the European Commission. So that's the number of concrete action and policies that requires environmental data. So this is where I say, when you do open science, when you do uh, open data, uh, when you develop monitoring system for the planet, you're not just writing a paper, you are actually feeding that process. Um, it's, it's, I would say I've been now in the commission for almost 20 years, I've never seen a moment where environmental data in particular on, on natural areas, forests or so, are so relevant, so wanted and so uh, important. Um, to build that, we need a monitoring system that has all those requirements because things are changing very quickly. So we want it to be timely. And in the past, the method we had, National Forest Inventory, to name just one, were not timely enough. They were always late. And in a, in a period of uh, very quick transition, being timely is key. Uh, but we also have to have spatially, spatially explicit uh, data and the methodology, you see that the, the errors connect one requirements to a potential methods. We want special explicit data uh, because there is where we have uh, to deal with adaptation of ecosystems, for instance, to understand uh, all the various inter integration and interaction between these various policies. It has to be transparent, which is very much about being open and reproducible, uh, comprehensive, robust, consistent, standardized, if you want. These are requirements we have on the floor to answer the request for our policymakers of all those policies before which means that at the end, we need an integration of all these methods. We need remote sensing, we, we need both from satellite, from aerial surveys, we need surface data, we need modeling, uh, and they have to work together. Um, and this means bringing together not only data and models, but bringing together also people, expertise, community brains, uh, to break barriers between, between those domains. And I think already in this room, we, we start managing you know, to have several of those expertise uh, discussing about uh, common topics and common methods. Um, in a way, if you want pr promoting, as we are trying to do at GSC, knowledge-based transformation uh, or supporting the knowledge-based transformation of our society is, is a complicated uh, road because you have to go through a lot of obstacles, which is about uh, the society uh, not being ready or to change so quickly or again, uh, try to do it with an economically sustainable manner. Uh, but that is where we need the help. We need the help really of an open science uh, where there's complete sharing and a very strong inter interdisciplinary collaboration because that's, those ingredients are actually needed to bring the society on our side, on the side of the scientists to understand that what we are doing is, it's not just um, production of a map or, or a paper, but is a tentative to find a solution. And, and there it's where, where, if I try to list, I mean, where open science do matters and can matter is in particular when you speak about air system science or the big environmental problems we have uh, on the desk at the moment is, for instance, dealing with the, this intrinsic complexity of a system where there are many components uh, that interact. Uh, when you have many, many systems, uh, well, I think many of you are programmers, no? uh, if you have to build a very complicated uh, code with many elements, uh, the key issue is, is the interface between and the communication between these elements. At the end, objects in object-oriented programming were invented explicitly, specifically for that, for that reason, to make the various components of a system to communicate properly. So communication is crucial. Um, but open science is also being able to reproduce science and to express uncertainty and to avoid that uh, fake news spreads in the media and generates um, eventually polarization in the society. Um, we have another problem uh, that we have to solve, this issue of the temporal spatial scales and the mismatch between the action that we are taking and the effects that we see. Um, all, all, all these elements are area where um, being open uh, is, is helpful. 
Um, and I have to say, I, I, I probably speak to the wrong community because they're already very open, but I tell you, it's not everywhere like that when we are looking, for instance, to yeah, have good reference data. And I think this is the problem of many. I've seen also publication to, uh, presentation today about paucity of data. And also yesterday in, 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 a, in another meeting, this was listed in a, in a slide as the most important problem we have. Uh, we know that there are a lot of data out there uh, that we would like to, uh, would love to, to work, but where we cannot put our hand because other communities are not, are not equally open. Two words about reproducibility. This is really fundamental for engaging and having this society on our side. We have to, to be trustable, we have to be reproducible. This is actually a pillar of science and in data science, being reproducible means being fully transparent and open. You know, th this, um, this issue is now, you can find it even in Wikipedia, like uh, defined as the replication crisis in science, now in paper in Nature and Science, talking about it, uh, of the, the difficulties that we have to reproduce our data science and to the need to be, um, to spend energy actually, to make that your results are actually results that others can, can replicate. And I give you an example on the importance of having robust think in, in, in a policy. What you see here is actually the trajectory toward carbon neutrality that Europe uh, wants to achieve in 2050. And on the y-axis, you have all the various sectors with the emission of greenhouse gases. And uh, if you look at the negative, the only negative emission we have, so the only values below the zero is the land use, uh, so the amount of carbon absorbed by land. And if you look at this graph, which is the official plan of the European Union, uh, you see that the sink, so amount of carbon uh, that the, we expect the forest uh, or the land to absorb in Europe is actually increasing from 2030 onward. So we are designing our policy, official uh, climate policy of the Commission, which is then transferred to the United Nations for climate change, uh, the, the framework on, on climate change, uh, and under this assumption that forests are growing more. But uh, is this really robust? And how, on which data was this based? Um, luckily, now we start having new data coming out, for instance, that show that maybe this trajectory, this increase in the sink, which is the dashed green negative uh, emission that we see there, is not so readily available. This is 100 years of plot data, 100 years for Finland, and 60, no, 70, I think, or so for Sweden. So very, very long time series behind those lines which are reporting the increment of the forest and the harvest rate of the forest of these two countries, Finland on the left, Sweden on the right. Uh, for Finland, is 100 years of data collection. Uh, luckily, these are now coming available and showing that actually the increment of the forest is going down. You see this negative trend uh, because of climate effects. At the same time, the harvest rate is going up. And, uh, the, the, and for Sweden, fundamentally the same. So we are in a situation where actually our climate policy, which is um, you know, envisaging an increase uh, in negative sense of, of, the, of the uptake is most likely not at reach. And this will lead probably or, uh, to, a, to a change. Uh, in our scenario. And this is not just opening, uh, happening just for Europe. We see what has happened this year in Canada. It's now Canada this year is for sure a carbon source uh, because of the big fires. It's happening in the Amazon, or someone is saying that there's a decline of, of the harvest, a uh, decline of, of, the, of the sink because of, because of a combination of land use change and, and uh, natural disturbances. Uh, when you speak about open science, it's not just about make it open and, and free, but it, it is also make it fit for the purpose. And when we speak about uh, I mean, the purpose of, of serving the development of, um, let's say, knowledge-based um, policies, this means that it has to be good. And when I mean good, it means that it has to have a level of a certainty, which is higher than the one that is needed to publish. In a way, Gilberto, you were touching this point today. You now, when you when you enter a certain domain, uh, when you want to affect policy, you want to affect uh, you know economic uh, dimension, then the science has to be good. And and here I see a risk. And and this is also a suggestion for all of you. I mean, producing data has become extremely easy because you have 
fast way to produce it. You don't need any longer a process model. You have machine learning. You have great infrastructure, great cloud computing, petabytes of data everywhere. Produce good data is difficult. It's about assumption. It's about testing causality. It's about making validation. But it's a process we have to do because otherwise we we'll, we we'll lose the trust, and the trust is what we need actually to bring our science into into the policy so, so, social triangle I was showing you before. I'll give you an example uh, of uh, a paper we wrote a few years ago. Anyhow, we have been exploring with, with, with my team the use of an available data set, the tree cover laws from the Global Forest Watch that was also mentioned today, um, very much used by, by many around the world. With, we mix it with country's case statistic with Google Earth Engine to produce global maps of uh, harvest. So Global Forest Watch is a great thing, but uh, the algorithm behind the detection of, of the tree cover change is not public, and neither are the updates of this algorithm, which is putting it in a, in a less than uh, optimal condition when it's to be used for, for uh, a, let's say, assessment that may have a political implication. Anyhow, that study led to this paper uh, handed up in Nature. Uh, where we were showing actually from this integration of uh, machine learning data uh, and uh, various level that there was an increase in harvest in the north of Europe. Um, and we did it without knowing in reality what, what's going on in the data processing in the, in the three core data sets that we have been using because fundamentally those information are not available. So this generated an enormous, enormous amount of uh, feedbacks well, two commentary in, in, in nature, uh, many in the media, uh, stressing that the, the research were very low quality, the data not trustable, and ended up to also to, to know from the programmer of, of the, the, the uh, let's say, tree cover change data set from the Global Forest Watch that there was a change in the algorithm here, 2015, 2016, that was not reported anywhere. So we, we, we did not know it. Um, so that was a bit of a scandal. Then we had to repeat to test the analysis, use more validation point. Then the line went become slightly lower. But but just one month ago, there was a new paper coming out in a remote sensing of the environment, where the same team actually um, reprocess. Um, I mean, the team that make the commentary to our to our work. Uh, so Hansen, Popatov are also involved into that reprocess the entire tree cover change of the set for Europe and ended up showing uh, this line. So actually, the signal is real. <laughs> it has nothing to do with, or marginally has to do with the change in the algorithm that was here. Uh, the change that they observe is exactly this, the same magnitude of our change. And those are the spatial pattern of being in the Northern Hemisphere is exactly the same. So that was, is for me, a, an exemplary case where we got a signal in the past that was not fundamentally fully approved by the society because of a data set that was not fully transparent. And that after a few years, it showed that actually that was real because when, when, you, when you compare actually the two, the two data, data are, are, are pretty similar. That gives you an idea when you bring science at the edge of um, um, that, that level that may influence a policy process. Uh, being transparent, be open, uh, is helpful. Otherwise, you may end up in a situation like this one, which are uh, disappointing and not leading the discussion at the speed where it should go. Because in reality, we have this problem in Europe. Harvest rate is going up. So what do we do? Um, still, I think we have to uh, be humble and think ourselves a bit like those kids, no? There's still to learn in, in, in our process of bringing science at the service of policy. Uh, and in particular, in our capacity of, of merging this three dimension of which we have been discussing a lot during the last two days, the, 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 the plot data, the, the satellite observation, the, the process oriented modeling, uh, to merge them in our, uh, in our domain of, of science, of environmental science, as it was uh, already done in other fields, like in the weather forecast, where th this kind of merging is already occurring. Uh, this is a challenge, uh, but I think I see there's a lot of enthusiasm around, a lot of young people that believes in this idea, and the idea of having open access for data, codes, models, ideas, human resources. 
and to make this knowledge and data cross scales into the frame of hybrid model. Um, that's one way to, to really help, I think, not only your career through a new paper, but help humanity and society to guide a bit that boat on a, on a safer route where uh, humanity can have less damage from the most likely future impact with some iceberg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandra. It was an eye opener. Do we have any questions? Yes, one, two. Thank you, Alessandro. I could think of no better way to end this workshop than your very, very enthusing talk. So thank you very much for touching very close to the hearts of everyone here. So uh, I think you're, you're mentioning this, uh, the opens, and I would like you to reflect a little bit on, on how do you see the open science as you being reflected on the current, uh, let's say, actions related to the systems that are in place by the Commission, because uh, currently the Copernicus Data Access Ecosystem is being implemented, but uh, in some would argue that it does not deviate sufficiently from the commercial mindset of Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, to qualify as a place to really do open science. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, thanks for, first of all, to, to the comment about my presentation. Um, so uh, my thoughts about you, you, you is that I think th there's a genuine, um, a real attempt to, to be uh, as open and as effective as we can, then do we succeed in doing it? It's also maybe that we don't hit the right technological uh, skills or the right capacity to make it really the best of the best. But, but the idea behind is that, yes, all this data, the efforts we are doing uh, have, to be, have to be public, have to be easy, e easily accessible. The, the problem is out how to build it in reality is, is, is complicated when you speak about certain data volumes uh, and where maybe other, even private company are maybe even more equipped. We have seen a lot of Google Earth Engine uh, work these days uh, in, let's say, an organization that are maybe able to provide tools for, for being open uh, that maybe you to private or, or in, let's say space agency cannot, cannot afford. But if, if it's not successful, don't think that this is because there's no will. <laughs> um, I think the will is there. Um, then still we have to you know, work on the, on the criticalities of making the machine working at the speed that uh, the, the current transformation in the data era in terms of the type of model you want, the type of machine you want, now everyone was GPU, a few years ago was CPU, and I mean, requires time, time of actions that for large governmental institutions are, are rather complicated. But the will is there. More questions? Yes, a question there. Yeah, thanks for the talk, very uh, inspiring. Um, I think like you, you should have one plot related to NFI data, and I, I do believe like without NFI data, like we can't do like proper validation on any of the product we can publish. And my question is like whether the commission is actually like trying to maybe like convince country to make this data more like accessible to our scientists when it comes to like validation, because I think we can't provide proper validation of our product. I mean, particularly in Europe, I mean, you, you saw like you had to do this work for, for the paper you guys published, but for us, it sounds like very hard to have uh, access to those data. So just wondering whether that the commission is actually like doing some lobbying uh, to the countries to access the data. This, this, your question is very close to my heart. I've, I've been trying to 
uh, with with all, all I had, I mean, my, my arguments, because I don't have anything else, um, to try and convince um, countries to be more open. And, and some countries do actually share data and share coordinates, but it's, it's in a situation where some countries do, some other don't. Um, the Commission, what can do is try to, I mean, build the, the instruments through which it can happen, but then is is really in the hand of the countries to decide at which level they want to to disclose their number. There was a, a perspective or a commentary, I don't remember, a perspective paper, I think, in Nature this year, written by the um, European Network of National Forest Inventory. I'm not sure if you've seen that, uh, two, three pages, where they explain why they don't disclose. And, you, and the, the main reason they say for permanent plots, this can endanger, let's say, the, the quality of the work they are doing. But I also opened the door to research community saying that, yeah, uh, under bilateral agreement and confidentiality agreement, uh, potential in this direction uh, can 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 be discussed. So um, my suggestion is get in touch with them. I know it's not the best way because, but get in touch through uh, what is called ENFIN, the European Network of National Forest Inventory, uh, where fundamentally all all the responsible of the national inventory are represented and they gather uh, to to discuss what you want to do. Um, the Commission cannot do anything else on that because it's really national. Um, properties uh, collected with national money uh, in an area which is the area of forest where the commission doesn't does not have a delegation for a policy forest policy is in the end of the country uh, what we are hoping is that in the future we go more in the direction of a full sharing of this data towards the remote sensing community this will bring to a huge advancement in our capacity of monitoring land and i agree with you without those data it's very difficult to produce High the high quality product that, that we would need. More questions? Can I just go back to that uh, Sweden case with the? Uh... You want to see the slide? Yes, please. Okay. So Let's go can, very, very can we not, like? So what? What if I understand correctly? So they uh, they had one paper they published that it's like extremely incredibly high harvest. Yeah. Then there was a reaction to it. Ah, you want the paper, not the data. So these are the data of the inventory, you know, just to okay. tell you, National Forest Inventory. But this became available only this year, fundamentally. So you see the harvest rate. This is plot data going okay. up and increment going down. When okay. these two lines cross, the land is a source of carbon because the, the land sink is the difference between these two, these two lines. Okay? Same for Sweden. You have increment going down and uh, harvest going up. Okay, no, the, about, about the paper, the paper is here. Yes, so there was a heavy reaction on that? Yeah, there was a very strong reaction because, of course, this was seen as a very large increase, not corresponding to what the National Forest Inventory was saying at the time. Okay. Now they, they are getting there. Uh, part of this signal, the reaction was also by um, a group of scientists, including um, those that are really producing the tree cover change data set from um, from the Global Forest Watch, uh, saying that this signal is due to a change in an algorithm, um, which, of which there were no, no sign in, in any report or literature or whatever. No one knew about it. This is about the transparency and sharing of the algorithm, how important it is. We didn't okay. know about it. But okay. at the end, we, we did all our testing and we realized actually there's not just that, there's also a signal behind, a real one. And actually, they actually... Rip not us. This is so interesting. So, so it's really, so it's like another a wave. point. It's like a wave. So they they went up and then they oh you're wrong and then yeah, and then they redid everything by uh, taking this algorithm away and they proved that actually this increase in the harvest rate is actually really there. Okay. It, there are three years in between these two papers. Three years it took to to do it, um, okay. but in the meantime we lose some time eh, because we we were dreaming to have a policy with a sink going up. Uh, and, and this policy was designed around those years. Why in reality our forest, this is half of European forest, eh? Finland and Sweden, uh, are showing uh, signals of a decreasing sink. So this is where, I mean, for instance, satellites can show the capacity of being faster, timely, of course, with some uncertainties. Some of this uncertainty can be improved through a transparent approach 
no sharing everything codes changes in agreed or so but but this but, problem is like in the core of our project you understand it's like open at monitor we want to provide a solution uh, in sense of uh, processing publishing code publishing data a solution to avoid problems like yes this. yes and this right? is exactly That's, why i was yeah, showing this yeah, year it's great. It's this great is exactly great. you know why yeah, we yeah, need we need this this mindset um, okay, thank you. Where where you bring you know this type of science in connection to policy, we have to make sure that is well done. Well done. Okay. Any more comments, questions, reflections? Is everybody still awake? Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, Alessandro. Thank you for, for joining the conference and a great talk.